Throughout the tenure of Wilkinson's career, a spectacle was made of the annual alumni game as returning veterans would line up against Oklahoma's best varsity squads. Back in those days, the pros weren't restricted from coming back and playing. And they weren't making that much money anyway, so they didn't stop them. So as you go out there my freshman year, I go out there as a quarterback lining up against these All-Americans, Stan West, Jim Weatherall, John Rapids, Leon Manley, uh, Indian Jack Jacobs, uh, you name them, they're over there. They, we never lost a game in three years. We never beat the alumni once. You were supposed to have been pretty good, so you want to go out there and show what you can do. There was pride because you didn't want to get beat. The varsity alumni game in the old days was a big game. I mean, it was great. And Bud's teams never lost, hardly, ever, college teams. And so he would tell the alumni what the varsity was going to run because he wanted the alumni to beat the varsity. That's the only time they lost. When the Sooners opened the 1956 season, it seemed as though the Oklahoma program just couldn't seem to shake Jim Tatum. The Sooners were matched against North Carolina, Tatum's new team, knowing a victory would tie Coach Wilkinson's 31-game winning streak. Tatum's players, unaccustomed to their new coach's style of play, got their first taste of the legendary 56 Sooners. Strong play from Billy Pricer set up the first touchdown. Jimmy Harris and Tommy McDonald hooked up before the half ended, a prelude to an intense intra-squad Heisman race. Sooner tackle Wayne Greenley and guard Ken Northcutt saw their season end during the first half. Both players suffered broken legs three inches above the ankle, leaving them as roommates in the university infirmary. The two flipped a coin to determine who would get operated on first. Winning the toss, Northcutt elected to defer, telling the doctors, practice on Greenley, be ready for me. North Carolina failed to put a single point on the board against a stout Oklahoma defense, and Greenlee and Northcutt watched their teammates roll to a 36-0 shutout. Kansas State was next, but the outcome was settled quickly. The starters only played 18 minutes. Wilkinson's recruiting had been so strong that its second and third string players were nothing short of first-class talent, rolling over the Wildcats by a score of 66-0. to zero. I think Coach Wilson looked for that um, character type player, one that had a lot of uh, endurance and loved the game, and also had some talent. I know Texas kids, I talked to them, you know, when they'd come in uh, to look over the campus, and, and they, were already, they were already made up their mind, they'd already made up their mind, I'm coming to Oklahoma. And it was just because of Bud Wilkinson. It, it just, it, that's what it boiled down to. After pasting Texas with 45 points, Oklahoma completed the first three games of the season with a combined score of 147 to zero. The Sooners traveled to Lawrence, Kansas for their annual meeting with the Jayhawks. At the end of the game, Kansas fans stormed the field simply to celebrate scoring on Oklahoma despite losing the game 34-12. Bud and Gomer turned the team's focus to their date with Notre Dame the following week. The Sooners went to South Bend facing a team that had not been shut out in 47 straight games. Preparation was the cornerstone of Wilkinson's coaching philosophy, one unifying goal in mind. The thing that, that I remember the most uh, was him using the term having the will to prepare. Uh, and he not only meant that in terms of uh, assignment football, but, but the mental aspects, anticipating anything that might happen. Uh, he was a big fan of Ben Hogan's as a golfer, and I understand Bud was a, probably, was a good golfer. And he, on several occasions, would tell us stories about how Hogan prepared for tournaments. He had dinner with Ben Hogan one time and he was uh, before a tournament and, and Hogan was holding a knife under the table. Then he asked him what he was doing. He said, I play each hole mentally five times before I'm there so I don't have to think on the spot. I'm prepared if I've got a certain shot, it's already in my back of my mind. And he said, if a person would play in their mind a game, what if you're a cornerback and they come this way and do this and that, what would you do? Most of us, we don't worry about that, but what he said, if you'll mentally prepare for what can happen in a game, 
when it happens, you'll be that much ready to react to it. I simply watch his feet, and as I start down the field and he turns to go with me, the minute the inside foot is planted, if I break to the outside, he can't possibly cover me because he's off balance since the wrong foot is on the ground. I think as I uh, developed the experience of coaching, I uh, really realized that the will to prepare was the key ingredient in success. Uh, when the game starts, uh, all of the uh, people in the stands and all of the players and all, uh, they hope that they will have the will to win. And uh, if you lose, often a lot of times the uh, media people and other fans say, well, the team just wasn't ready today, they didn't have the will to win and so forth. Well, at game time, everybody has the will to win. Believe me, everybody does. The band is playing, the parents are in the stands, uh, the co-eds and the girls are there, families are there. Uh, the will to prepare is getting out of bed uh, at uh, 5.30 in the morning, going to morning practice, and you're stiff and sore, and you don't want to practice. And if you do not practice totally productively, you have wasted that time. And that is what I characterize as the will to prepare. It's not uh, the flags flying and, and game time at all. It's the off time situations that you have got to know that this is important enough to you that I can't lose this time and ultimately be able to be the best. And so the will to prepare is tantamount, really, to the ability to win. Among the highlights of Oklahoma's performance was the defensive play against Notre Dame's star quarterback, Paul Horning. Of Horning's 13 passing attempts, Oklahoma defenders picked off four, including two that would return for Sooner touchdowns. Ironically, by season's end, Horning had the Sooners to thank as he was handed the Heisman Trophy. You know, here McDonald and Jerry Tubbs kind of uh, knocked each other out as far as votes are concerned in the Heisman Trophy, but I thought Tom McDonald should have won it. And I thought Clinton should have won it his senior year. I probably cost Tommy the Heisman. <laughs> we, uh, we went to OSU the last ball game, and uh, Tommy and I were tied on the same team for leading scorer in the nation. But at the end of the ball game, I had scored a touchdown. So Tommy's trying to get his hands on the ball, and very competitive. He's a great, great guy. I mean, he's, he's just competitive. He, he's, he knows he's one down. And, uh, but Ed Gray is our right tackle. He's a senior, and he's getting ready to call. Tommy's trying to get his play in. Jimmy's ignoring him. And anyway, Ed said, I've never scored. So I, I went to tackle and Ed stepped back and he scored his first college touchdown, but Tommy uh, was one down. I, I led the nation in scoring and he was number two at, at behind me. But that's an amazing statistic for two kids on the, on the same ball team to, to have that record. In all the years that I watched Suter football, my favorite team and the team I thought was the best of all time was the 1956 Suiters. They shut out their first three opponents that year. They had a great team. They beat Notre Dame at South Bend 40 to nothing. The one scare they got in 1956 was at Boulder. They went out to play Colorado, and Colorado had a single wing offense and a very talented football team. At halftime, Oklahoma was behind 19 to six. And the way they played the first half, it looked as if the winning streak would end at 35 games. Wilkinson gave one of the shortest speeches at half I ever heard. He, we had this history of people who had brought this streak to us. They were, they were three years before me, um, and then I was part of three. So a lot, of, a lot of red shirts had come and gone to get us to where we were, and we're fixing to blow it. And that's the only time that I ever saw Bud really you know, show his disappointment <laughs> in the way we were playing. 
but we go back out and Jimmy, uh, I catch one in the corner and I think I caught a couple. Tommy got one down the middle. Uh, again, we could pass. Uh, they all go back to, it wasn't any big deal and bang, bang, we're back in it. We got a good scare. Had we not been able to throw the ball effectively, we probably uh, very easily could have lost that ball game. Oklahoma continued its five game road trip in Ames, Iowa. Oklahoma ripped the Cyclones with 44 points, resulting in the team's fifth shutout of the season. The defense was impenetrable, holding Iowa State to four first downs and 35 total yards of offense. Wilkinson's split T offense rolled for 503 yards while only punting once. A near perfect execution of the offense that Wilkinson had perfected. The splits in the line uh, divided the players enough that if you could, our term, stand off with them, you didn't create the hole because the hole was already there. And my experience in football was uh, playing single wing football where you had to double team people and knock them aside to open the hole. So it was just uh, sort of the wave of the future, option football and uh, the split T, the splits meaning the holes were created before you snapped the ball. And uh, it was, uh, the offense of the future. It was a great offense, it really was. It would still be a great offense if they hadn't changed the rules, I think. The rule was that if a uh, lineman once gets it down now, the new rule, if once you're set, you can't move. And in the split team, you take those huge wide splits. If somebody's in your inside gap and he's gonna get the quarterback who's working down the line, you better move in and cut him off. And you could do that in those days. But when they said you can't move, then I think that hurt the split team more than anything else because you couldn't take those wide, wide splits. Oklahoma welcomed Missouri to Norman for the final time under the leadership of Don Ferro, who retired at the end of the season. Wilkinson's 10-year rivalry with his coaching mentor never ended in defeat as he defeated Ferro at his own game by an average score of 34 to nine. The curtain call for the rivalry ended in a grand finale as Oklahoma pasted the Tigers 67 to 14. Clendon Thomas's 11 yard catch at the beginning of the match got the Sooners on the board first. Slugging their way through the first half, Oklahoma built a 34 to zero lead as they headed into the locker room. A peculiar shakedown in the AP poll left the Sooners with 92 first place votes, although they fell to second place behind Tennessee, which held only 58 first place votes. The Sooners were at risk of losing a national title, despite their undefeated record. When the stadium address announcer announced that Tennessee had beaten Mississippi 27 to seven, Wilkinson's boys knew they had to turn on the heat. Oklahoma went into attack mode, pushing across the plane of the goal line five more times in the second half. McDonald's fine play led the Sooners with an average of 12.3 yards per carry, including 58 and 23 yard touchdown runs. Harold Keith credited the score update from the PA announcer as a critical turning point in the game and ultimately the season. Updated scores from across the country had become a tradition at Memorial Stadium, led by head basketball coach Bruce Drake. They still do it today, but Bruce did it early, giving scores of other games. Dodgers, eight. New York Yankees, five. One day, he was looking at the ticker, and here came a score. Slippery Rock, 21, Muhlenberg, nothing. Slippery Rock? So he went on the PA. Final score, Slippery Rock, 21, Muhlenberg, nothing. Well, everybody went crazy. From that day on, Slippery Rock's score was on the PA announcers every Saturday. <laughs> Nobody knew where Slippery Rock was. The Cornhuskers of Nebraska took to Owen Field under their new coach, Pete Elliott, who had changed sidelines from Oklahoma at the start of the season. Elliott's players saw every bit of Oklahoma squad, with Wilkinson again playing every athlete who dressed for the game. The terrific trio of McDonald, Harris, and Thomas put on a show. Kickstarting the game with a 54-yard run, Thomas put the Sooners in close with fourth and goal, Harris pitched to McDonald for the first score of the game. 
Harris rushed for a touchdown later in the game and then added another through the air on a 48-yard strike for McDonald. When the last down had been played, Oklahoma prevailed 54-6. The victory ended Wilkinson's first decade of conference play undefeated. Well, if uh, I contributed anything to football of an original nature, <laughs> it was the Oklahoma 5-2 defense. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, evolved it from uh, the seven-man line. Uh, there was, uh, at that day and time, uh, seven linemen were one of the standard defenses. And in order to have a little more fluid ability and uh, ability to cover passes and make adjustments, we, on the 5-2, dropped the ends off the line of scrimmage, so they became linebackers. And then we had the five linemen, not the seven linemen. And we had the two inside linebackers in addition to the now two outside linebackers. And uh, we were able to funnel very well uh, everything to the middle guard. It was awfully hard to, to go wide against us. And uh, the defense has uh, stood the test of time. It's uh, something that uh, every team plays today. <laughs> It's known still as the Oklahoma defense. And I think they, every coach has thought it was a good defense against the split T. And it was a good defense against everything, really. The legendary season was nearly complete with the final chapter yet to be written on the turf in Stillwater. The streaking Sooners had won 39 straight games, enough to tie the record set by legendary Washington coach Gilmore Doby in 1914. Conference rules prohibited the Sooners from bowl play, leaving the Aggies as the only unfinished chapter of the storied season. Oklahoma wasted little time getting on the board. Jay O'Neill made a key defensive play, intercepting a pass and returning it 63 yards for an Oklahoma touchdown. That was all it took. Wilkinson's locomotive was rolling again. And by game's end, a lineup of seniors closed out their perfect careers with a 53-0 romp of their rivals. With a perfect 10-0 record, Oklahoma was awarded the 1956 National Championship. And the season closes on what some have called perhaps the greatest college football team in the history of the game. There were 18 seniors on the all-victorious 1956 football squad. Hugh Ballard, business major from Memphis, Tennessee. John Bell, business education from Enid. Bill Brown, geology major from Wagner. J. Henry Broyle, business major from Wichita Falls, Texas. Dale DePew, engineering major from Oklahoma City. Robert Derrick, business major from Woodward. Tom Emerson, zoology major from Wilson. Ed Gray, business major from Odessa, Texas. Wayne Greenlee, geology major from Breckenridge, Texas. Bill Harris, business major from Ardmore. Jimmy Harris, social science graduate from Terrell, Texas. Delbert Long, English major from Ponca City. Bob Martin, mechanical engineering from Cherokee. Tommy McDonald, industrial education from Albuquerque, New Mexico. All-American halfback and winner of the Maxwell Trophy and the Sporting News Award. Jay O'Neill, petroleum engineering from Ada. Billy Pricer, industrial education from Perry. Bob Timberlake, geological engineering from Tulsa. Jerry Tubbs, economics major from Breckenridge, Texas, All-American lineman and winner of the Walter Camp Award. To these fine men, Bud Wilkinson paid this tribute. To the 18 seniors of our all-victorious team of 1956, go our heartiest congratulations. To these men belong the rare distinction of never having played in a losing college game. A record unparalleled in modern collegiate football. This magnificent achievement was made possible by their spirit, courage, unselfish cooperation, and loyalty to the team. Their record should be an inspiration to the men who will fill their places in future seasons. With the 1956 title under his belt, Bud Wilkinson became the only person ever to win three national championships as a player and another three as a coach. 
It was a feat that defined the word impossible, yet managed to fall short of Wilkinson's greatest and proudest accomplishment. Dad said many times, both to us personally and uh, to others, that uh, he felt that breaking the color uh, line uh, here at the university uh, was really the most significant thing he had done as a head coach, uh, that it was, uh, it was uh, more important than all the great winning streaks and the conference titles. And of course, he gave all the credit to Prentice Gott, who was just such a class act, uh, first a superb athlete. But uh, Prentice had the uh, character and the poise to be able to uh, undertake uh, the severe pressure at that time. Uh, a lot of uh, profanity, uh, racial hatred. Back in those days, uh, the common communication was the telegram. And after ball games, when Prentice was playing, my dad would probably receive 15 to 20 telegrams that were filled with profanity and hatred. But uh, he always took great pride in the fact that Prentice was not only the first black uh, athlete at the University of Oklahoma, but um, uh, in the in the South. Long before I got here, Norman was a uh, was known for a place where, where where black people did not live, and so consequently, this was a town that was uh, that reflected a, a lot of America, and certainly most of Oklahoma, where uh, African Americans uh, were considered second class citizens. At that time, um, Douglas High was the only high school that blacks went to. All black students went there. So the first football game that was ever held between a black and a white high school was when Prentice played in it, and that was Northwest Classen against Douglas High School. It wasn't just the players. It was uh, all African Americans commuted here. Uh, if, if one indeed was working as a maid or a gardener or in, in some other cap uh, capacity, uh, one could, uh, could work here. But you have to remember, or, or maybe you have to remember, can't remember what you didn't know. Uh, this was once a, fun, a sundown town. That meant that uh, black people had to be out of out of Norman uh, before the sun went down. So consequently, it was not uncommon for for black people who were here before Prentice, as an illustration, uh, to find themselves commuting in and out of here. It, this was this was kept very quiet. Uh, the way that I got to, got to Oklahoma, there was a, uh, a group of black doctors and pharmacists that decided that they would give me a four-year scholarship to go to Oklahoma. And Bud, one of Bud's assistants had uh, watched me play in the All-Star game, and after the game was over, said that Bud wanted me to come to the University of Oklahoma and that he would be talking to some people to make this happen. Well, they kept it, as I said, very quiet, and it was kind of like I was given a, given a chance to see what I could actually do on that football team. Uh, these doctors, there were about uh, 30 physicians, pharmacists, had put a four-year scholarship package together. I went to the University of Oklahoma, and after being there for two months, Bud sent that money back to the Metaphor Association and put me on scholarship, but nobody really, really knew it. Bud requested that, uh, that he meet with me. He had heard about me, and, and I, I, I I just put the cards on the table and I said, as, as near as I can ascertain, it was not an easy decision for you to recruit uh, a, a black athlete and let him then start uh, on the football team. He said, of course, there were many supporters who said that uh, we like our team white. And uh, years later, we find, for example, if people are using that analogy, uh, they would say we like our team black. But it took it took Bud Wilkinson, uh, and actually Bud said the players uh, were much, much more astute than he. After uh, several practices, they understood what, to, what Prentice could do. And they said, uh, Coach, we've got a winner here. Now, they were very polite, and they said, now, Prentice can spend uh, four years sitting on the bench and, and watching us, or he can spend four years helping us. And I think the, uh, the clincher 
for Bud was when one of them said, you know, with Prentice in there, we still had a chance of beating Texas more often. Like, hello, the lights came on. And then I asked Bud, I said, now, let's also be honest about this. If this scenario had turned out another way, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here, would we? He said, no, because I probably would have lost my job. After all, he was told not to do this. But I think the point is that going to the University of Oklahoma in 1956 was a, a terrible time. 1954, the Board of Education, the Brown versus Board of Education <laughs> happened. And all of the doors opened, literally. The doors opened for integration. 1956, I went to the University of Oklahoma. I went to get an education. I wound up to play football. I tell you, I wanted to play for Bud Wilkinson. I had seen Bud Wilkinson on television. He was one of the uh, spokesperson for the Air National Guard. I knew that uh, Black had not played at the University of Oklahoma. And so I felt like the only way that I would be exposed to this man would be to join the Air National Guard. But I, uh, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Some people would say uh, that was the worst thing that could ever have happened because Oklahoma football was going to go kapooey south. Um, for me, it was good. It was a good thing. I found that Bud had uh, a lot of confidence in me. And one of the things that I also found out that he was a good psychotherapist. I was in his office every Wednesday on the couch, uh, <laughs> telling him about the things that had happened and the things that I didn't feel like I would be able to take and uh, all of the problems. And after I finished talking that, I would get off the couch and go to practice. And uh, I did that for the first uh, well, it was about a year and a half. And that's how I think I got through uh, the ordeal at the University of Oklahoma. Prentice um, did not really talk to me about the things he was having to go through. I think his idea was to protect me from what he was having to endure. And in saying that, that's probably the reason why he talked to Bud Wilkinson a lot. He didn't want to burden me. Uh, my mom was kind of, I think, she, I think in a way she was, she was glad about it, but uh, wondered probably how I would be impacted and my dad just say, hey, he'll do it. Um, there were times that I didn't think that I was. And as I said, without uh, Bud's couch, I don't think that I would have made it. I told uh, countless students and other individuals uh, that Prentice Gaunt was our Jackie Robinson. There were other athletes who were more talented, Jackie admitted, and Prentice admitted, uh, than, than, than they were. But they didn't have from my perspective and others, they didn't have the disposition, they didn't have the, uh, the emotional and uh, emotional grounding to allow them to be subjected to not only the overt taunts and the overt conditions of racism, but the covert ones. Uh, the uh, rapid change in the segregation situation is one of the marvelous things that has happened in America in my lifetime. I remember uh, when we first played Texas, Prentice's first year, the uh, Dallas law was that a Negro could not stay in the same hotel overnight with a white. So I remember we, they could not, could eat with us and so forth, but I remember uh, Prentice being in their team meeting 
and uh, then dinner, and then the show, and I was uh, putting in a cab and driving him over to the Negro Hotel to spend the night, and then I picked him up in the cab the following morning before breakfast and, and took him back. Well, the only bowl game that I went to was the Orange Bowl in 1959, and all the wives always went to those games. Now, things were still pretty segregated in those times. We did stay at the same hotel, but our social events were with prominent blacks in Miami. Now, after the game, they have this really elaborate party at a very exclusive country club there in Miami Beach, and Prince couldn't go. And so it, it was a real problem because we weren't going, the team wasn't going. But the people, the powers that be said, look, let's see what we can work this out. So we're kind of standing around the front of the hotel. The buses are there to take us to the fancy old country club. And uh, we, what's going to happen? What's going on? About that time, a great big long limo pulled up and Cab Calloway. was a, you know, a real, real star. Uh, stepped out of the uh, limo, had a, two lovely young ladies with him. Uh, they got Prentice and got in the limo and away they went. All our guys wanted to go with Prentice. I mean, <laughs> they had to go with this team party, but that was unfortunate. That was not a situation it should have been, but that's the way it was. Uh, but like I said, Prentice was, uh, always was, just a gentleman. Unbelievable guy, bright, smart, Dr. Prentice God, you know, just a wonderful guy. Prentice did not want to be known as, as he said, a jock. And I think in the end, he really wasn't known as being a jock because he, he grew so much more than that. He did so many more things than just be an athlete. It's hard for some students to understand that somebody paid for them, especially the minority athletes. Somebody paid for them to have an opportunity to compete for all of the positions. Uh, and it was the Prentice Gods and the others who, who, who paid for them to do that through uh, the subtle and not too subtle uh, things that happened to them on and off campus. Let me tell you a good experience that I had as a freshman. What we would do, we would practice with our t with, against the varsity and then we had a game. So we practiced with the varsity, and then we got on the bus and we drove to Tulsa. After the game was over, uh, they had dinner set up for us at, at a chain restaurant. I need to call the name of the, the restaurant. As I walked in, there was a, a, a black lady who was serving food, and she said, you can't she whispered that to me as I walked by her, and I said, uh, what did you say? You can't eat in here. I said, oh, we, the whole team's coming in, so forth. So I went and got a seat. Shortly thereafter, uh, two guys come running in, and they ran up to me, and they said, sir, uh, uh, we have a nice place for you, downstairs, candlelight, so forth, and you can eat there. And I said, wait a minute. I said, I, you mean I played with these guys out here? and on the football team, and now I can't eat. Well, it's, it's not our policy, but uh, uh, we do have a place for you downstairs. So I said, well, if I can't eat with them, I just won't eat. So I turned around and started walking out. A couple of the guys saw me going out, and they said, where are you going? I said, well, I can't eat in here. And they said, well, if you can't eat, none of us will eat, and the whole team got up, marched out, got on the bus, and we rode to just the, ins just the outskirts of Tulsa and uh, found a restaurant there that would serve us. And... But anyway, I felt like I had made it at that point to have that whole team get up and move with me to place to eat. He had the, the ability, his God-given ability, I think, in terms of temperament, to be able to put all of that in perspective and realize that he was here to play football. 
and also to get a degree. I like that about him uh, because it took an individual who was a student athlete in the truest sense of the word, uh, but we lucked out with him. Oklahoma began the 1957 season with the longest winning streak in the history of college football. The Sooners quickly picked up two additional victories before making the trip south of the Red River. Awaiting the team was another former OU coach and star, Darrell Royal. While Wilkinson's pen was busy rewriting the record books, colleagues around the country began to prune their own leaders from the Oklahoma coaching tree. Uh, Dad was instrumental in helping Coach Royal get his job at the University of Texas. And, uh, I'm not sure he would have ever uh, succeeded had my dad not stepped up for him as much. But Coach Royal's philosophy about football and life was so consistent with my dad's. And uh, I've always felt that one of the interesting things about uh, the football profession is that, that coaches share their information with each other openly and willingly. And so, uh, and knowingly that if you defeat your friend two or three or four years in a row that you might cause him to lose his job. There's still that respect and that friendship. And of course, when you uh, enhance that by the fact that Coach Royal played for my dad and was an All-American player, there are so many stories about Coach Royal that uh, uh, he was such a huge part of the Oklahoma tradition. Oh, I've talked to him about it, and he just said, well, that's just the way of life. You know, we, he said, uh, I didn't think they'd get, even hire me. And when they did, I said, he was at my house when they hired him, when he heard that uh, he had been hired. And uh, he said, I, when you're sleeping on the floor, you can't fall out of bed, Charlie. And I said, well, you got it. You were right there. Texas wasn't as power that it is when he got there, after he got there. So he took it from the floor up, and so he did a great job. He's a, he's a winner. Coach Royal had his Longhorns prepared when the number one ranked Sooners took the field, quickly asserting his team as the aggressor. Mickey Smith boosted Texas with an interception, setting up a Walter Fondren to Monty Lee pass to take the first lead of the game. The two teams continued to battle throughout the remainder of the first half, but not at the score at seven at the break. In the third quarter, OU went on a charge to put the Sooners up by one score. Then Sandifer's interception stopped the Longhorns' final push. Walt Fondren back to pass, but Oklahoma Santa Fe intercepts. Defeated but far from disgrace, Texas falls 21 to seven before the nation's number one team, Oklahoma. The $64,000 question, how long can the Sooners go on? Darrell Royal loves the University of Oklahoma, and he particularly loved Bud Wilkinson. My information, my studies of those early day games is the first time uh, that Texas won. There was jubilation in the locker room in the Cotton Bowl. And some reporter is looking for coach. And he's not to be found among this backslapping and partying going on. And so he goes looking for Daryl. And Daryl is outside behind the building crying because he loved Bud so much. And the idea of beating his mentor and the guy that he loved as, in a football sense more than anybody and admired more than anybody, it was a little hard on him to take, a little tough for him to take. He was my coach, but I also studied him and I watched every move he made. And he was a great example to set to try to be like. But uh, I'd always wanted to coach. I knew that back when I was a freshman in college. So the best thing to happen to me was Coach Bud Wilkinson. Game of the week turns out to be the scare of the season for Sooner fans who pack Owen Field on Dad's Day to see mighty Oklahoma undefeated in 44 straight tangled with the always tough Buffaloes of Colorado. Oklahoma coach Bud Wilkinson on the left has a healthy respect for the ability of Colorado's Dallas Ward. He always has some surprises for the Sooners. It was, I think, in the second quarter, maybe in the third quarter, where I was fortunate to break through and, and block the extra point, which ended up that we won the game. Had I not had the privilege of blocking that extra point, we could have tied the game and not had continued our winning streak at that time. Oklahoma then chalked up two road victories over Kansas State and Missouri, 
the 13-0 win over Kansas State gave Coach Wilkinson his 100th Sooner victory. After the 39-14 win at Columbia, Oklahoma's winning streak set at 47, and the team had set a national record by scoring in 112 straight games. I have the distinction of playing in game number 47 of the 47 game win streak. So, uh, now we didn't win naturally. They, uh, they just wore you out with their speed and their quickness. They huddled, uh, I think, one or two yards from the ball and, uh, you know, would run 90, 100 plays a game. And of course, that's when everybody played both ways. You played offense, defense, special teams, and everything. And it really got to you. And, uh, you know, they would play their first team a series or two. Here come their second team. They'd come back with the first team. They might put the third team in. And meanwhile, you've been out there the whole time. And it gets to be a long day. The nation had noticed the Oklahoma dominance as Sports Illustrated made its case why Oklahoma is unbeatable. September 16, 1957 is a day Oklahoma fans will never forget. And our touchdown cameras are in Norman to record this historic football game. The Sooners are unbeaten in 47 straight games. And Oklahoma features a scoring streak of 123 consecutive contests, both of which are all-time collegiate marks. The last team to down OU was Notre Dame. And the Fighting Irish are Oklahoma's opponents today. Stay put, for you're going to see the game of the year. It was November 16, 1957. Oklahoma was celebrating the 50th year of statehood that day, and Notre Dame came to Norman to play the Sooners. Oklahoma had won 47 consecutive games, and they figured to make number 48 rather an easy chore. In fact, the Sooners were 18-point favorites to beat the Irish. This was not a great Notre Dame team at all. They had lost that year to Michigan State by 28 points. They'd lost to Navy by 14. In fact, they had lost 10 of their last 16 games when they got to Owen Field. So most people said, this is gonna be a breeze for Oklahoma. Well, it was not a breeze, not at all. Terry Brennan had devised a plan against them. What he wanted to do was have his defensive linemen fill the gaps and break up the splits between the Oklahoma offensive linemen. He figured by doing that, he would disrupt their rhythm, and he also had his linebackers blitz quarterback Carl Dodd as many times as he could. As a result, Dodd fumbled the ball away to the Irish twice during the game. And as a result, Notre Dame stopped Oklahoma cold as far as offense was concerned. The Sooners had four good scoring opportunities in the first half, could not capitalize. It was nothing, nothing at intermission. I remember he told us at the half, the only games you'll remember are the ones you lose. It was still nothing, nothing as they went to the fourth quarter. And then Notre Dame got the ball at its 20 yard line with about 13 and a half minutes to play. For the next nine minutes, the Irish controlled the ball, moved down the field. 19 of the 20 plays they were to run on that drive were runs, one little jump pass got to the three yard line, fourth down, goal to go. Terry Brennan was the Notre Dame coach. He said, the angle is not right if we try a field goal, let's go for the touchdown. During the drive, their fullback, Nick Pietrasani, had gone from guard to guard, banging off those positions left and right all the way down the field. So the OU defense was, I think, primed to stop Pietrasani. But instead, Bob Williams, the quarterback of Notre Dame, used a play that they'd never used before. He told his halfback, Dick Lynch, Dick, I'm gonna pitch you the ball and you circle right in. They did it, not a Sooner touched him, and he went into the end zone for the touchdown. Three minutes and 50 seconds remained. The extra point made it seven nothing. Oklahoma had one last chance. They got as far as the Irish 24 yard line, but then a pass was intercepted in the end zone and Notre Dame ran out the clock, snapped the Oklahoma streak, and won the game. We just struggled, and uh, mentally, I don't, I don't think we were prepared. Uh, I'll say this, and I could be wrong. I don't think the coaches were that, you know, keyed up about the game. We always had, just to make things fun and interesting, we'd always, Bud had always put in at least a half a dozen new plays, and. Uh, we didn't put on any new plays. We just said, 
lined up and said, here we go. And uh, they just did a good job and beat us. That was a game that uh, we knew someday might come, but in hindsight, um, we could have easily won that ball game. Um, we made a mental mistake on the goal line, or they wouldn't have gotten in. And it would have been 0-0, zero, zero, and maybe we would have scored. But they would not have won. We would not have let them in. But, but that mental mistake cost us a score. I was on the Oklahoma sports publicity staff as a student assistant at that time under the great Harold Keith. And that particular game, he assigned me the Notre Dame dressing room after the game to get quotes from the Notre Dame players, bring them back to the press box, type them up, and distribute them to all the media members. So while Notre Dame was putting together that game-winning drive, I left the press box to make sure I didn't get blocked somewhere and went across the field to the Notre Dame dressing room. When I got there, there was no one inside that dressing room. When I walked in, there was a blackboard that they had used at halftime for Terry Brennan's discussion with his players. And on the blackboard were these words, we won this for all the Catholics in Oklahoma. After the game was over, uh, we were told to come into the locker room and wait for coach. Well, he was gone quite a while, I'd say 15, 20 minutes, and we still had our gear on. I mean, we still had shoulder gear on and hadn't started taking our gear off. And he comes in and uh, he mentions the fact that he had taken time to drop by the uh, Notre Dame team and congratulate them, That's, that was him. And he spoke to Coach Brennan, congratulated him, and as, as he was leaving the locker room over there, Coach Brennan walked out and he told him the story that one of the things that was evident in that game to him was that a year before, Oklahoma had gone to, to South Bend and beaten this same bunch of guys 40 to nothing. And they were gonna do something about it. They had made a decision to do something about it. So one of the players drew up on the chalkboard in South Bend, 364 days of the Oklahoma game. And every day, someone would, either a trainer or a manager or a player or a coach, would erase that and put one one less day. That went on for a year. Now, to, to, to to understand that, that means they didn't care about any of the games. But they were going to come to Norman and they're going to, they're going to win this ball game. And they did that. And Coach Wilson came over and told us that story. And, and then, then we took our gear off. But it was almost like sitting there and waiting for fifth quarter to come. And so I, I showered, I cleaned up, and I started off at the south part of the, the stadium here. and I was walking over toward the dorm to eat, to eat my evening meal and I looked around and the stands were still full of people just sitting there in the stadium. I could not believe that they were still sitting in the stands. After the game, he came in and he said, I'm proud of you guys. You've done something that no other major college football team will ever do again. You've won 47 straight games. And he said, I just want you to remember that the only ones that never lose are the ones that never play. Despite the disappointment, Oklahoma still finished the season admirably winning the Big Seven Championship and earning a date with Duke in the Orange Bowl. Led by consensus All-American Clendon Thomas, Oklahoma tallied two touchdowns through the air. Two other touchdowns landed in Sooner hands when a pair of interceptions were returned for scores. It never rains, but it pours in the final minutes. Broadhead passes. Bennett Watts intercepts. And the Sooners are off on another of their spectacular rampages. Near midfield, Watts laterals to Dick Carpenter. He completes the 73-yard gallop, and Oklahoma routes Duke 48-21. Wilkinson's meteoric rise made him a guiding force in college football. Entrusted as a member of the Football Rules Committee, he played an instrumental role in implementing the two-point conversion rule. We uh, widened the goalposts. Uh, we uh, set the ball back from the two-yard line to the three-yard line. And I'll always remember this. I was a very sound exponent of the change from the one to two-point conversion rule 
And uh, the year the rule was adopted, we played Texas, and Texas went for two, and they won 14 to 15, yes. and I was not at that evening very satisfied with my vote, <laughs> really. Oklahoma A&M never defeated a Wilkinson-led team, and after changing its name to Oklahoma State in 1957, the Cowboys joined Oklahoma from the Big Eight Conference in 1958. The Sooners fared well in the Big Seven, winning every conference championship of its 10-year existence. Coach Wilkinson never lost a Big Seven game to the Cowboys, and the result remained unchanged with the advent of the Big Eight. Conference rules were holding the Sooners from returning to a bowl game in 1958. Determined to put the best team in the game, Orange Bowl officials successfully petitioned the Big Eight, allowing Oklahoma to meet Syracuse in Miami. Uncertainty had boarded the plane with the Sooners, as academic issues forced Wilkinson to leave his starting quarterback in Norman. Second-team quarterback Bobby Boyd had developed unbreakable chemistry with his alternate unit, leaving third-stringer Bob Cornell to assume his first game as starting quarterback in the Orange Bowl. We as quarterbacks uh, spent a good bit of time with Coach Wilkinson during the course of a week, coaching us on how he wanted us to call plays under certain situations and, and against certain defenses. And he was very detailed about it. We'd go, we'd have an hour out of class, we'd go, he'd schedule us to come in, say, at 10 o'clock on Monday or Tuesday or something. And on the desk, he had his little men and uh, set up in a defense. And then he'd tell you, okay, you got the ball on your own 20 on the right hash mark, first quarter scores nothing, what are you going to call? So he'd call a play. And he'd, he had a field there, and he'd let you make two yards or five yards or whatever and then you'd kind of work it down the field. And that's when he first started. But as we went along and he got more detailed, you'd walk in and sit down with him, behind him up on the wall, he had a screen. And so you'd call a play and come out of the huddle, and be, now you're behind, and what you, he took his pick, they took the pictures behind what would have been a center. And now you're looking at the defense, and he could change it instantaneously. So you call a certain play that's dead against that defense, you had to check off of it, and you had to do it real quick. Because uh, he really checking, Checking offense was really not to the great play. It was to get off a bad play. Uh, but he was so detailed in that regard. So actually, we were kind of robots. I mean, when he wanted us to call a certain play in a certain situation, and uh, after doing that for a number of hours, it got to be, that's what you did. Prentice Gaud was the first to find the end zone after a stellar 42-yard run. The Sooners were effective throughout the match, building a 21-point lead before Syracuse responded. The Saltine Warriors never attempted a pass, amassing 239 rushing yards in their 21-6 concession to the Sooners. When the season ended, Oklahoma had landed as the number five team in the country, placing in the top 10 for the 11th consecutive year, a national record. Oklahoma was the clear-cut football power in the nation, and outsiders were looking to take advantage of the rolling Sooners. A very unusual thing happened to the Oklahoma football team the night before they opened the 1959 season against Northwestern at Evanston, Illinois. For the first time in 20 years, Oklahoma, a perennial football giant, will test the strength of a Big Ten power as the Sooners engage a highly regarded Northwestern team at Evanston, Illinois. A severe outbreak of food poisoning hit nearly half of the Oklahoma first team on Thursday night, and Coach Bud Wilkinson hopes his charges have recovered enough for the game. The Oklahoma players went out to eat at a restaurant in Chicago called Chez Paris. And suddenly, a few minutes after they began to eat their food, some of the Oklahoma players became violently sick. They had to rush to the bathroom. They vomited. They were in bad shape. Some of them were rushed to a hospital. When it was all said and done, many of the Oklahoma regulars and second team players were so weakened that the next day they were not even close to their capability as football players. When the game was over on that Saturday, the Sooners had lost 45 to 13. The FBI was called in to investigate, and as a result, Bud Wilkinson never complained. Said, you know, we just weren't the better football team that day. But there was a lot of mystery to that whole story in Chicago, and the truth may never be known. Gamblers had somehow penetrated the supper club security and adulterated the fruit cocktail. The Chicago police showed very little interest in the matter. 
The 45-13 outcome was the worst loss in Wilkinson's years as head coach. The rough start to the season continued as the preseason number one Sooners fell in two more road trips. None was greater than the loss to conference rival Nebraska. Led by former OU assistant Bill Jennings, the Cornhuskers handed Wilkinson his first conference loss. Throughout his tenure in the Big Six, Seven, and Eight, Wilkinson won 74 straight conference matches, and the loss in Lincoln was the first in 12 years. Most players on the squad couldn't remember the last conference loss in 1946. Harry Truman was president, Jim Tatum was head coach, and the Sooner freshman had yet to start first grade. Oklahoma teams had grown accustomed to winning, and as the losses piled up, players began to lay blame throughout the locker room. Dad knew that it took a person of Prentice's stature and character and quality to uh, be able to be subjected to all of the uh, criticism. And it was not just from the fans. Uh, there was a period of time even within the team, which really surprised my dad. Uh, that uh, he had to have some uh, very serious meetings to get everybody um, uh, to understand the importance of uh, supporting Prentice as a player and as a team. Let me tell you one experience that we had. We were getting ready to play Army, and we were just getting ready for practice. And so we were waiting for Bud to come out, blow the whistle, for all us to assemble and go through calisthenics exercises and warm-ups and so forth. Well, after uh, we had all been there for a little while, he came out, but he didn't blow his whistle. And he came over to the crowd, to the group under the tree, and he said, I want all of you to go back in, take your, uni your practice uniforms off, practice, we will not practice today. Boy, everybody just stood and looking at one another, and uh, what's going on? Nobody had heard anything about this. So we all walk in, I mean, just dumbfounded. Nobody, there's no talk, we're just walking in. And finally we get in, and everybody's taking off their gear, and Bud comes in and says, I want everybody to come up front. We all gathered there, and he said, Somebody, and you know who you are, somebody has been talking about this guy, and he pointed at me, saying, what in the world? I hadn't heard this. Somebody has been talking about this guy, and if you're men, you'll stand up, and instead of talking about him behind his back, talk to his face. Turned around and walked out. There we were, all there, looking and waiting, and I'm, I've got my head down because I'm the center of this thing. And I surely hadn't heard anything, and then about what seemed like a moment of eternity, guys started popping up, and they started saying to me, Print, I said such and such about you, and I'm sorry, I apologize, I didn't mean it. And one of the guys who was competing with me for a position stood up and said, I apologize, you're a better player than I am. And so after about five or six fellows started saying this, I stood up and I said, I can't take any more of this, this is too much for me. Uh, and I had, obviously had some tears. Uh, that was a very emotional time for all of us. I think it probably <coughs> melded us as a, as a team. Uh, we played Army and, and won the ball game. Um, but that was... Uh, it was just amazing to see some of the guys that I had no idea had been saying, had been talking about it behind my back, stood up in the, in the midst of not only myself, but the team, and uh, apologized. Amazing 
Behind Wilkinson's leadership, the team pulled together to win another conference crown and finished the season seven and three. Concluding the best decade of football by any program in history, Oklahoma's record throughout the 1950s was an overwhelming 93, 10 and two. With the nation's best football program sitting in their own backyard, fans across the state were high on their squad. But the 1960 roster did not live up to its predecessors. Uh, we uh, felt that our recruiting was the state of Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle, and we used to, on the map, swing a compass. Uh, Dallas was the center of the compass, and anything within uh, 150 miles, uh, we could maybe get that boy to, to come to Oklahoma. Uh, and that includes Texas Panhandle. And I didn't ever realize that uh, Oklahoma had earned uh, a, enough publicity and enough uh, really uh, accolades that we probably could have expanded that uh, recruiting area quite a bit. But at that point in time, I didn't do it. Uh, we uh, did not have, in 60 and 61, the normal athletic ability graduate from high school and we just uh, didn't have the talent at that point in time. 1960 was not a good year for Oklahoma. I think they went three, six, and one. And in 1961, they opened the year with five straight losses. The day after that fifth consecutive setback, Bud went on his television show and made a statement that blew us all out of the water. He said, we're going to win our next five games. They did, and finished at 500. The five-game winning streak to end the 1961 season was billed as the greatest sports story of the year. Coach Wilkinson pegged the comeback as the greatest coaching thrill of his career. In those days, Army was a big deal. So Bud, he decided, because we were the underdog to Army, as we went into that ball game, he, he derived a uh, trick play. And uh, Bud would tell me during the week if they were gonna run a trick play and what to look for before the trick play. Now that's a great advantage for a play-by-play -play guy. But Bud would actually tell me that. And uh, Army huddled on defense, a real huddle. So Bud had a play where we ran to the sideline and didn't even hard to block it. Didn't want to gain any yards. Just strung out to the sideline. And then on the way back, came back in formation and got to the ball and snapped it and skirted the pitch out, sweeping the left hand. Army was huddling on defense. And Mike McClellan went 75 yards for a touchdown and OU won the game on that trick play, really. And the, the New York Times or whatever, one of their newspapers next day, Sooners outflank Army was the headline. The revival exemplified his command of the coaching profession, but the early 60s saw Bud's focus shift away from the football field. Yes, sir, we're the sitness nation in the world. Never have so many sat while so few moved. Pictures certainly ought to give us something to think about, Bob. Well, we're doing a lot more than just thinking, Jerry. Fortunately, we got people in our country who are doing something about it. One of them is President Kennedy's consultant on youth fitness, famous coach of Oklahoma's football team, Bud Wilkinson. Dad was a very uh, disciplined uh, person that worked out regularly, and I know as a coach, he felt that if he was uh, demanding his players to be in exceptional condition. It was important for him to be that way too. So before the season would begin, he would work out, he would run laps. Physical activity was very important to him and he maintained it throughout his entire life until the latter years when he became ill. And I think that's another reason why it was so natural for him to be the head of President Kennedy's Council on Physical Fitness because um, that was part of his being. Prior to the 1961 season, President John F. Kennedy asked Wilkinson to quit his position as Oklahoma head football coach and assume the full-time role as special consultant on youth fitness to John Kennedy. 
My ability to address the problem with the proper media and public support was enhanced by the fact that I was an active coach and suggested that I handle the situation part-time so as to not lose this important asset. He readily agreed. Fulfilling duties in both Washington and Norman, Wilkinson scrambled to compose a steady team for the 1962 season. In an unprecedented move for Oklahoma's head coach, Joe Don Looney stepped onto the Norman campus as the only junior college transfer that Wilkinson ever accepted. Looney's performance on the field was stellar, but as the team dropped two out of the first three games, outsiders questioned the stability of the Oklahoma program. Between 1947 and 1959, Oklahoma lost only 13 games, but when the team dropped his second game of 1962, Oklahoma had lost 13 more. In classic Wilkinson fashion, the team rebounded with a seven game winning streak that landed the team in the Orange Bowl. The Sooners were set to face coach Bear Bryant, now the coach of the University of Alabama. A matchup of two coaching titans, the game even drew the attention of the nation with President Kennedy viewing from midfield and visiting the Oklahoma team in the locker room before the game. It's probably not the best time to have the President of the United States to visit your football team, but Bud invited him in and he came in and of course we were all in awe. The funny thing that happened, we had a guy named Larry Vermillion from Chickasha. And Larry was kind of a chunky guy and he had a little poncho on him there. And I, I almost remember the words exactly, but President Kennedy said, you know, your coach is my physical fitness director and I wanted to come and see some of his products. And he looked around and there's Larry and he punched him in the stomach. He said, what happened to this one, bud? And everybody just roared laughing. You know? <laughs> Poor old Larry's face got him. <laughs> Melvin Sanderfeld stopped Alabama's initial possession with an athletic interception of Joe Namath's first pass. And it appeared that Oklahoma might draw first blood when Ron Fletcher found Allen Bumgarner on a 56-yard pass play that moved the ball to the Crimson Tide six. But an ensuing fumble ended that threat and the Sooners never got close to pay dirt again. The team finished with another Big A championship, but the 17-0 loss sent Wilkinson back to Washington, D.C. with his first bowl loss in more than a decade. He and Coach Bryant were the very closest of friends, and uh, Coach Bryant, of course, uh, his first team in the Sugar Bowl, when the coach was at Kentucky, uh, broke the 31-game winning streak. And then in the Orange Bowl, when Joe Namath was the quarterback, uh, they defeated the university uh, as well down in Miami. Uh, I believe Charlie Mayhew talked about how hard dad pushed the team for that uh, game against uh, Namath. Charlie didn't probably weigh more than 180 pounds, but he said that they ran him so hard that his pants almost fell off of him, that his belt couldn't hold up his pants. Oklahoma's second game of the 1963 season was a portrait of pageantry. Defending national champion Southern California was looking to defend its number one ranking at Memorial Coliseum in Los Angeles. A national television audience gave Oklahoma an opportunity to prove that its program had not wavered as one of football's premier programs. Temperatures soared to 115 degrees as the game approached and Southern California coach John McKay petitioned to move the game to the evening to diminish the heat's effect. Wilkinson refused, knowing his team was well conditioned. Dressing the squad in only light pads and a t-shirt, the Oklahoma team staved the heat in the pregame warmups as USC fell prey to the sun in its full game attire. Joe Don Looney was the first to put points on the Trojans, turning a double reverse upfield for the score. USC responded strongly, but failed on its extra point attempt. Mike Ringer's fake to Jim Grisham added six more points to the Sooners' favor. The lead was enough to hold off the surging Trojans as Oklahoma withstood the heat of the nation's best team, delivering a defining 17-12 upset in Wilkinson's 17th season as head coach. The following game against Texas matched the two top teams in the country, together for the first time in the history of the rivalry. Injuries forced Oklahoma to start its third new quarterback in as many games. Far gone were the teams full of veteran warriors, groomed to follow leadership with pride. Wilkinson stood by stoically as his boys fell to the Longhorns, despite a roster brimming with talent. Behind a fine wave of blockers, Ford rolls into the end zone on a 12-yard burst. Texas forgot to read about Oklahoma's number one ranking. The Longhorn lead 14-0 at halftime. Team leadership is, is something that is hard to, to see or put your, 
put your finger on. They had it going there for a while, and then, then you start having the, the Joe Don Looney's and the John Flynn's and some of those guys that were just it, did things that I can't imagine happening while while I was there. A personal foul against Oklahoma makes the sophomore signal caller even more determined. Christini takes the Sooners by surprise. He passes on a rollout for a touchdown. Oklahoma's dreams of a national championship are shattered in the Cotton Bowl. The Sooners surrender their number one ranking to the Texas Longhorns, who upset Oklahoma 28 to seven. Following the Texas game, the team voted to dismiss Looney from the program. For the sake of team chemistry, the change in the backfield proved necessary. Oklahoma moved on to win its next five games, including a 13-3 victory over the Missouri Tigers. Oklahoma was poised to win another conference crown with a win over the Cornhuskers in Lincoln. But a single call over the radio Friday brought the country to a halt. President Kennedy is dead. This is official word. The president is dead. The president, ladies and gentlemen, is dead at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. When we arrived in Lincoln, Bud called Bobby Kennedy and asked him his opinion, should they play the game? And Bobby apparently conferred or whatever he did. Anyway, he told Bud he thought that his brother would want the game to go ahead and be played. And the Nebraska legislature gave their okay. So Mr. Morgan, the producer of our radio, decided we would run no commercials and that every commercial break, time out, we would play funeral music just to relinquish his advertising time today and ask that you join in a moment of silent respect for the memory of the late President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. The emotional Sooners took the field in a trance. Images of the President's visit to the locker room still resonating. The nation had lost his president and a coach, his friend. Oklahoma walked away from the field without a victory, but the greater loss weighed heavily on the coach's mind. I'm not sure, looking back, it was a good thing for the university to play that day. Uh, Rick McCurdy was an all-conference end on that team, and a wonderful friend, great player, and Rick has said many times that he felt it was a, a tremendous disadvantage for Oklahoma to have to be in Lincoln uh, during such a horrific uh, period of time. Everybody was so full of grief and so very saddened and it was very difficult to get emotionally prepared to play and uh, the outcome of that game of course was that we lost to Nebraska but I think dad always felt that it really was the thing to do uh, because the, uh, the Kennedy family wanted uh, it done and I know he felt it was consistent with their philosophy and their attitude so he felt very strongly about it uh, who knows what would have happened if they played a week later. Well, uh, he certainly was a football fan, Howard. Uh, when I would go in to see him to give him a report, uh, uh, I knew that he was busy, and I'd always have to try to prepare this as carefully as I could and make the memorandum as brief as possible, and uh, I'd always make up my mind that I would take as little of his time as was absolutely necessary. But on every occasion, he would uh, open the conversation by asking me about how our football team was getting along or what did I think of this team, and then after we had uh, transacted whatever business we had, we always wound up again talking about athletics. Perhaps the uh, number one memory I have in this respect, Howard, uh, relates back to uh, the second time I saw the president. Uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, Diefenbacher, was in Washington at the time. I had an appointment to talk with him about would I uh, or would I not be able to take on this position, and I had had some time to think about how I would approach it. Uh, as I walked into the White House grounds, I saw the president and the Prime Minister come out of the main portico, and I didn't uh, think it would be a good idea for me to be involved with any of the press, so I hurried into the reception room and sat down, and a few minutes later, the president and the prime minister came in, followed by the photographers and the press. Uh, he saw me and said, Bud, come over here. He said, I uh, want you to meet the prime minister of Canada. And he said, Mr. Prime Minister, you know this gentleman because he coaches Oklahoma, and you've had all those fine Oklahoma football players uh, at Edmonton. He said, Darrell Royal and Claude Arnold and Frankie Anderson and Roger Nelson and all of them. and uh, 
Diefenbacher being a good politician smiled and said, oh yes, but I could tell he had never heard of me or had never heard of Oklahoma. But the president certainly had. Uh, he was a football fan in every sense of the word. What was the last time you saw him, bud? Uh, last July, Howard, just before I came back to start the season. And uh, at that time, I recall the last things he said. Uh, uh, he wished me luck on our season, said, I hope that uh, you'll have a very successful season. And he said, tell that team that I think they can win them all. Well, we didn't win them all, but uh, on this Thanksgiving Eve, let's not look at the fact we lost two. Let's be thankful we've won seven so far, and let's also be thankful all of our other blessings. I know you'll go along with that, bud. I certainly will, Howard. Uh, we are all fortunate to be citizens of this great country where we have freedom of worship, freedom of citizenship, and the opportunity to make of ourselves what we will. After beating Oklahoma State 34-10 in the season finale, the team voted not to attend a postseason bowl game. As the new year approached, rumors swirled about the future of Oklahoma football. I'm announcing my candidacy for the Republican nomination for the United States Senate. I think it really uh, was the, uh, the, the key event that took place that uh, uh, really told my dad inside that uh, he felt compelled to uh, leave coaching and uh, become involved in uh, government service uh, running for the United States Senate. I uh, felt that uh, someone should do something to improve the course of government and uh, maybe I could play a part and that's really why the, if I had not been the consultant on physical fitness uh, I don't think that I probably would have ever gotten involved in politics, but uh, the Washington experience uh, led me to the step that, uh, yes, I would be a candidate for the Senate. Bud Wilkinson might have been the most popular man in Oklahoma, but he picked a bad year to run for office. 1964 was the year that Lyndon Johnson buried Barry Goldwater in the presidential election. Could you give us any idea of what you intend to tell the convention on Tuesday? Well, I want to uh, talk to them a little bit about uh, why I became involved in politics, the depth of concern that I have over the course that our country is taking. Wilkinson, in a race that had 912,000 votes cast, lost to Fred Harris by only 21,000 votes. Bud was stunned. He thought he would win and might go on to a political career from there. He made a mistake, they said, because he should have registered Democrat instead of Republican because of Oklahoma not swung the Republican jet. He also went to court and got his name changed from Charles Burnham Wilkinson to Bud Wilkinson. They said it, it turned some people off. I don't know why it would. Everybody knew him as Bud Wilkinson. But he, he was hurt by that, and he, uh, he couldn't understand that. They, they said, you're in trouble. He said, no, and they go to the ballot box and see my name, he'll vote for me. It was nice for him that he was able, after that defeat, to uh, an, start an extraordinary career in the uh, television industry. Many people were surprised that Dad's career as a commentator lasted longer than his head coaching career at OU. He was here 17 years as head coach, and he had a 20-year career in television. In 1965, he was on ABC television as the top college football commentator in the country, working with Chris Schenkel for a long time and later with Keith Jackson. But Bud was so good as an analyst. You know, when you get into X's and O's in football, it can get a little bit complex and a little bit uh, confusing. But he made it so simple that the average fan who loved football sitting at home watched him, and he could instantaneously pick up what he was trying to tell them just by the way he did it. And he didn't have to use X's and O's on a chalkboard for the television viewers to see it. But he came across as succinct and yet very knowledgeable, and he knew the game. Did he ever? When, when Bud had retired from coaching, he was doing uh, television with Chris Schenkel. They came back to Oklahoma, and, and uh, Bud always said, you know, when he passed away, he wanted to have his ashes sprinkled on, on Owens Field. And then anyway, he came back with Kushenkel, and they came out on the Friday before the game like they usually do. They went up in the press back looking down, and 
you notice it was artificial surface now, <laughs> not grass. And then, as he was brought, as they were going through their stuff, why, uh, one of those Zamboni machines <laughs> came along and was <laughs> cleaning off the artificial surface. But said, "I don't think I want to be buried here anymore. <laughs> I don't want to end up in a Zamboni machine." Uh, Oklahoma had such a fantastic run. It was it was just unbelievable. When you, when you consider that they did not lose a conference game for 12 seasons, you're talking about 74 conference games in succession that they did not lose. It was just unbelievable, the power they had. I have such pride thinking about the greatness of the Oklahoma teams and these multiple conference championships and the three national championships and the winning streaks of 31 and 47 straight games in a row and how competitive the game is. That's where I have my deepest pride, to know that my father was able to lead a group of people over a number of years that were able to consistently demonstrate excellence. And uh, I'll always just feel just great pride for what he did. And we talked about in a previous class that the most powerful thing in the world, I say, is the splice. After the war, he's back in Oklahoma shooting big red football. With over 500 games in the can, he's still going strong. Ned Hockman was uh, every much uh, of a success in his profession as my dad was in coaching. He was really a good person for that job and a good guy too. Coming out of uh, my association with Bud Wilkinson, he used to tell his teams, never panic and always maintain your dignity. I think that the most powerful thing in the world is the splice, the splice of film. You can juxtapose this scene and this scene together and create another idea. The most important thing is that when the light comes on, somebody flips on the light and the audience says, oh, I see what you mean. Man, that's it. I love it.